So let's start. My name is Hannes Reuter. Welcome to our joint workshop titled Merging Statistics and Geospatial Information Lessons Learned Towards Inspire. Uh, I'm working at the European Commission in Eurostat and at one stage we were responsible also for the Inspire files. That's also why we are uh, involved here. Now that has been handed over to GSC mostly. But uh, why do we organize this workshop here as well? We, we're doing lots of GIS work. The G GISCO team, I'm working in the GISCO team in uh, the E4 unit, and we are concerned about reference data in the European Commission. We are coordinating specific bodies for GI information or geographic information systems in the Commission. And that's the reason why we have invited or why we organized this workshop here today. We want to give a little bit of feedback and transfer over from what also the national statistical institutes do in terms of GI work in their um, work together to the Inspire community. And if this computer would work... Yeah. So, workshop objectives is... Um, let's start from the bottom. That we have lots of questions from, you, from the audience, that we have lots of discussion, uh, hopefully, and at least for me, uh, lots of, lots of follow-up actions. Right? So that's for me. Um, what we want to achieve, um, and you will see, from, for example, from my presentation, that we disseminate some of the knowledge which we have developed, or in the different grants which we are presenting today to the wider community and also provide an overview of the implementation of geographical information together with statistical information. And if at the end we even identif identify a set of issues which need further attention, that's even better for us from a perspective of Eurostat or National Statistical <laughs> Institutes. Um, what we will have this afternoon, we have a couple of presentations, um, starting f from me, um, from Eurostat, providing statistical da data towards SDMX, and um, I hope after the presentation, I mean, maybe ask in the room how many people have heard the name SDMX ever in their life, there one, two, three, four, five, six, oh, seven, eight, oh, that's already quite a lot, that's good to know. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is where we'll start off. We will see an implementation from, uh, no, not from BART, from Athena, thanks, from OGC, uh, on behalf of actually of GeoNovum or the Dutch uh, statistical CBS, um, which implement uh, table joint services for the dissemination of statistical uh, geostatistical information and then we have a presentation from Ian on using the semantic web to link geographic geography and statistics. Uh, after that I would propose we make a break and have a drink, a, drink a, at least one cup of coffee to keep us awake after that lunch and we have two more presentations uh, by our Polish colleagues about spatial visualization of demographic data and then from Statistics Slovenia on stage, an interactive tool for visualization and dissemination of geostatistics. So, um, having talked about that one, we st start straight with the first presentation. And you have to listen now to me, unfortunately, again for a couple of minutes um, about Eurostat, providing, you see here at the bottom right, our offices in Luxembourg. Um, and I just want to, oops, sorry, um, give you a first impression. So, are all of you familiar with Eurostat? Should I maybe, you all, should I skip the slides? Um, maybe I give you just three slides on that one. I really hurry so through them, so you are not really too bored on that one. Um, we are the statistical office of the European Union, and well, we have the mission to provide high-quality statistics to the general audience in, uh, in to European citizen. Uh, we are a normal general directorate, 
and we are the central institution of the European Statistical System, ESS, and where all national statistics institutes are involved. Uh, we have around 800 staff, and um, what we do on a regular basis, we collect data, we harmonize data, we provide definitions and classifications to the member states, and we compile European aggregates. We are not working on the member state level, no, that doesn't make the member states themselves, but we compile European aggregates and then we disseminate statistics. And I will show further on in the presentation some statistics what we provide daily, twice daily. We have embargo lift at 11 and 2300 hours. It's slightly different than, let's say, G in our GI world or in the Inspire world where we have not such a stringent production dissemination chain. Um, you might wonder what, are we, what, what do we disseminate or what do we bring out. Here you see some euro indicators like monthly values, quarterly values and uh, in F April and October for example we even uh, publish numbers on public deficit and depth. So um, just to give you a slight update on the dissemination chain um, twice a day. Um, we provide usually a full data dump, or this is one of the ways you can actually get the data from us. And uh, Google and Reuters, they immediately grab the data and uh, get out of it and uh, you see the actual numbers then popping up on their websites and it's automatically in their processing chain further processed. Um, in our dissemination chain there is, um, let's say, file-based formats. It's a TSV, tab separated values, DFT and SDMX format, where you can get the data, let's say, in HTTP or FTP access from our, data, from our uh, dissemination system, as well as the SDMX REST and SOAP services. And I will show you later on in practice. No, not in practice. I have to apologize because the internet is not working on that laptop here from the university. But I pr prepared some slides, so if you pick up the slides later on, you can do it at home and test it yourself, the SDMX access to that data. Um, enough of Eurostat and what we're doing. I think I gave you a small overview. Um, and just want to give move forward on SDMX and it's important for statistical distribution. Um, why is SDMX uh, what is, makes it interesting. If we go back to W3C uh, um, just on their website and looked a little bit in, I think it was in January this year, three linked data vocabularies are W3C recommendations. And out of that one we see three. We see the data catalog, DCAT, we see the data cube vocabulary and the organization ontology. So the three W3C recommendations. And then, at least that's for us as a statistical commu community, the data cube vocabulary brings the cube model underlying SDMX. So here we have the statistical model coming back into the game, into the W3C uh, conventions. So at least that's from our side is where we think is SDMX is one part of good data distribution towards the public. Um, What I wanted to stress as well from compared to GI, GI world or Inspire world or geoinformation system, systems world is we have a production process in the statistical world. And if we're talking with an Inspire, Inspire implementation, if we would put it here, we see it mainly in the SDMX. I mean, if we look at from a more abstract point of view. Here we have SDMX and data dissemination, no, DDA document. I forgot, I forgot always the acronym DDI, sorry, I need to actually look it up, a data document initiative. So this is implementation level, uh, uh, layer. But on that one, on the other hand, we have our the whole production chain, which you see at the top, with the nine different production steps to actually come to the dissemination from actually the data collection. And I think the statistical offices, due to the fact that they are much more oriented towards production, uh, are much more in this business layer and modern production organization. 
So just to show you a little bit where if we compare uh, Inspire and Statistical World a little bit, where are we together? And if we even bring that further, and the following slide you actually can completely replace with all the Inspire words and acronyms which we have. Fostering interoperability in official statistics, common statistical protection architecture. Arena? Hmm? Would be possible there? Identifying issue? EULF? EU, no, EU? Yeah, ELF? Would be following there? Frameworks and standards for statistical modernization. I mean, that maybe comes out, but I mean, these frameworks we have as well in our Inspire context in our Inspire scene. And then we have our statistical data and metadata exchange and the uh, general statistical business production model, which I don't think we have yet in our Inspire scene or in our GI world. Maybe ESRI runs their production like that. I'm usually, I haven't seen so many people talking about a general uh, uh, GI business production model chain working, is talking about. But if we look at similarities between the statistical world and the GI world, just want to give you one further hint where the GI world, I think, is already further than us. Here we have two different statistical offices, Canada and Sweden. And in these offices, we do collect data, we process data, we analyze them, and we disseminate. What's the current status for the moment? is that everybody builds his own chains. And we cannot exchange data, uh, exchange methods or exchange software tools. And hopefully in the future, we can do that. So actually here in Sweden, we ca actually can use a tool from Canada for the dissemination process. Or maybe at in one stage in al analyzing data, we can also replace it with something from uh, Canada or vice versa. If we go back to the GI world, Inspire world, we have the different components and we can exchange these. Because thanks to OGC and different standardization organizations, we can plug and play different components out there. Just want to give you some thoughts here further. So let's get technical. Uh, just said that uh, we will look in SDMX and how that, uh, does that work. Just want to show you the SM SDMX, what is currently in production. Um, and I just want have one um, question for you. So please don't use it to pull all your stat data from our servers. Please use it for restricted small scale data sets, because otherwise you're breaking our system. So for if you want to get the full data set, please use a bulk data download. So if you want just to get the last 10 years of population um, count for the Netherlands, then this would, would be possible to use the service for. So what you have here, we have a SOAP and a REST protocol. Uh, you can get the available data sets, data flow. You can get the structure of the data sets and you can just get the data. And similar to what we see in a uh, get, capability, get Capabilities document, for example, or Get Record by ID for metadata, uh, similar, this is how is uh, SDMX working. And for example, if we want to get uh, our data structure, we would execute our first request here. REST data structure eStat, because it's, uh, uh, it's our organization, uh, data structure, health, and accidents. This is the acronym for that one. This one you, would ne you need to look up still. And then, in the second step, you would get the data. Let's just look at the first one. This is the data structure where 
Unfortunately, I didn't make it big enough for you. I apologize for that one. But you, for example, you see in here the age structure year 15 to 19, year 15 to 24, which is coding then from the age structure for this one from 15 to 19 years or from 15 to 24 years. Now to get actually get the data, you just write a similar request as before. Here we see health again. We want the total numbers, uh, the code from the NUTS code, the statistical uh, units for Europe. You can get that. And you specify your start period from 2009 and your end period to 2010. And you can have that viable and you can program it via an API as a service. And then you receive actually the data. One, two, three, four, five. No? Sorry. Yeah. Here you see the data. And unfortunately, I apologize again for 2010, 61.5. For 2009, 60.3. So this is the way, programmatically, to receive data out of Eurostat's dissemination chain restricted to what you want and what you need. Um, if we go for usage, and I mentioned that before, uh, if we look at our SOAP and REST uh, requests for the moment, from Eurostat side, last month we had only 7,000 requests on that one. So it's not really popular compared if we look at the bulk data download where we have a NAS in, in January we had 600 gigabyte data sets the free data explorer database extraction or TGM 500,000 requests each from each or we had 3 million user, user sessions so there's still a little bit of uh, user demand so lots of people do it manually extract the data manually and not really going into this kind of machine interoperable ex data exchange Let's move on. Having talked a lot about statistics, about SDMX, uh, let's move a little bit further towards Inspire. Um, maybe two words for more from um, our group and what we are doing in the Commission. Um, we're promoting and stimulating the use of GIS. So, for example, we are responsible for a reference database in the Commission. We do spatial analysis, georeferencing of statistics, user support. Um, and we were one of the leaders. I, sorry, I have to apologize. We, are one of the, we, were, we were one of the leaders of the Inspire Directive, and now this has, has been shifted to, to GSC. Um, just give you a couple of examples what are we doing or what are we distributing. So for example, we are running actually the Inspire at EC portal. This is not to, um, there's a distinction between the Inspire Geo portal run by GRC and the Inspire at EC portal. This is the inside European Commission portal for our uh, internal Inspire data di dissemination. So there's a standard uh, viewer of data uh, metadata um, client and based on that, on top of that one uh, we also for example distributing population grids for Europe. Um, if you have been in the previous session in over there, someone actually used Eurostat's data to make an ArcGIS online service in the ELF project for population for NUTS3. This is possible, but this one is actually based on the data, the population data provided by the National Statistical Institutes uh, in the Eurostat, no, in the Geostat project. So it's much more detailed on a one kilometer raster. So and it's freely available at Eurostat for download. Um, one more example for GI work uh, where we are involved is the Statistical Atlas. Um, yes. 
um, which we provide every year. This is one of the key publications from Eurostat where uh, data are discussed, explained. Uh, for example, here we see the population density. We have items about health, education, labor market, uh, agriculture and fisheries, um, science and technology, how many patents have been filed in the last year uh, uh, as of publication. So coming almost to an end, um, just to give you an idea what we see for further in our presentations, we are financing grants with uh, national statistical institutes and cooperation, and they can choose if they want to cooperate with the national mapping agency um, to facilitate actually implementation of geographic information in the statistical production process. Um, to look, for example, at spatial distribution of uh, statistical phenomena or at improved statistical map application or statistical data management. Just to show you a couple of use cases which are in the current grant pipeline. Um, our colleagues from Statistics Austria, what is important for them? They're calculating the need for their census. They need to calculate the commuting flows between, that's a hypothetical example here, the place, so it was here, the place of Statistics Austria and where the workers are coming from, where is the residential location. This is kind of normal GI question the statistical offices are posing and need to answer. Um, health statistics. Um, um, another statistical, statistical institute groups the um, location of hospitals into health regions to find out where is my distribution of hospitals optimal and where should it be to what's compared to my population distribution, should it be optimized. Further, our colleagues from Finland together with the um, National Mapping Agency of Finland, they're actually looking into expanding the Oscari framework to find out the use cases of where or how many uh, not billions, not millions. How many thousand people living around a given point, or how many ten thousand or hundred thousand people living a, a, around a given point? Uh, um, what's the population distribution there? What's the age distribution there? So they are looking into grid based statistics, so combining these two things. Um, and I think I have two more use cases. I really apologize, but I cannot do anything. Eh? I mean, this, um, an example I really like is from our colleagues from Italy. They're actually working on migratory flows. What you see here is, a, in, is an evaluation, actually. Where are the people from Roma, Milano, and Venezia are coming from out of this country? So they are coming out Cisina, the, the, um, the orange one, Nisporni, Calari, and sorry, the, the, the last one I cannot actually myself read. But these are kind of questions they need to identify from a statistical perspective. So they need to find, they need to talk to different address registers, they need to talk to immigration, and they need, then need to identify from which nuts regions they're coming here we're uh, uh, coming back to the geocoding problem and then they need to identify to which regions they are actually moving and working and living later on this is kind of questions they are posing towards uh, uh, gi use of gi and then last not least uh, for example the germans they're trying to work uh, in the with the urban audit organization germany they try to harmonize address registers all over these little cities in germany so finishing up with my presentation um, what we have seen is actually the wide variety of applications and data sets for in and outside European Commission usage. 
um, why we are here or what we're trying to do with these grants. We're trying to foster collaboration between national statistical institutes, national mapping agencies. So they actually use uh, more GI work in the statistical world. Uh, from our GISCO team, we are providing meta the metadata portal for the European Commission as well as reference data sets, reference database. And if we look a slight step back and compare what we see in Inspire and in our statistical work, we have in the statistical world, we have a production with daily dissemination where maybe the Inspire world or GI world can learn from. And on the other side, on the other side for example, we have in the GIS world, we have much more interchangeable GIS standardized software products, which we from the statistical world also can learn from. So with that one, thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for discussion. <laughs> Questions? Are you all still satisfied from your lunch, from Danish lunch? No? No further questions then maybe? Oh, sorry. Desperate, you needed a question. I'll no, provide. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, th like data is in SDMX, is it easily uh, read into ge geostatistical packages? Okay. Um, SDMX, if, if we really want to make it simple, it's just a simple XML file which you can process in Python, in R, uh, whatever you want, uh, and further process because it's. You can put a uh, XLST on it if you even want it and to transform it further or process it further. I mean, it's not really difficult and I think we will see further um, uh, presentations on that one in, in a couple of minutes. But it's not really difficult to handle. I mean, I Sorry, one more time. For the geolocation identification of the yeah. um, Eurostat is only allowed to distribute, I hope I'm giving, uh, getting that yet now correct, down to NUTS free level for European wide level. So what you had seen before, uh, if you recall that I s mentioned a couple of codes, each of these statistical or administrative units has a specific code like DE 00, yeah, 00 is Germany. <coughs> DE 01 is then, uh, sorry, DE 0, DE 01 is then one level down, one further level down. So with that one, you have a um, real identifier for that one. What I actually learned and what I'm not aware yet of is if Eurostat provides an URI service for the different geographical units on that one. Because I know uh, Ian will probably show something like that later on. I'm not aware that Eurostat has something like that. Okay, thank you. In your experience, sorry. in your experience, which is better to do the statistical work within AGO uh, domain or before you get to the geo domain, you do the statistical work and then you tabulate it. <laughs> oh, 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 thank you very much for that question. Um, personally, I think I would still try to stay in the GI world. However, that might be especially as we are moving into an electronic society and people are getting more used to having cell phones, uh, surveyors going out with a GPS, all that. Um, from a practical point of view, sometimes I don't know if we <coughs> can handle the amount of data which is coming in with a GI uh, demands or if we, if we always want to stay in the GI world. So for example, if I'm just sending out a surveyor and he has um, to answer, he gets a list where he goes out and has, has to t ask 10 people to get a question. Okay, how old are you? 
Um, for, for the age, for the age, 20, uh, 21. Okay, how old are you? 21, right? Uh, yeah, what's, uh, your, your average income is somewhere between blah, 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 yeah? What's, uh, what's your marital st status? Okay, all that, fine. Paper list, Excel sheet, whatever. However, if we're putting a GI on top of it, okay, I need to have a GPS on it. I need to have a location on that one. So this is all getting then a little bit more complex and also more technically challenging, as certainly in a production environment. So that's the reason why I'm saying, from a personal experience, I'd rather have GI and later t tabulate it, but I'm, we are at the GI division and not at the statistical production division. And this is slightly, that's the difference between us. Hmm? But the statistical units, they consult us usually on a regular basis, for example, for transport statistics, to find out what's the distance between ports on a river, or what's the distance on, 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 on rail track or on roads. These are all reg regular uh, customers, clients from us. But uh, we're a little bit like a, super, not supervisor, advisory role to, towards the statistical reduction. Okay, thank you. More questions? Otherwise, we move on. So, does this, well, I don't know that. It's, good. it's okay. Yeah. I know. Hello, I'm Atina Trakas. I work for the OTC and I'm replacing my colleague Bartelat, Bartelat who is currently in another session, who was supposed to s replace Michel Grote from Gionovum. So, <laughs> um, some of you might be surprised to see me here and when talk about statistics that's not my major uh, yeah, happy topic to hear you. yeah but um, I was briefed very well and actually you will see um, I think it's uh, selbst erklären, as we say in German um, straightforward so so yeah this work um, has been done by Gionovum, by uh, Michel Grote and Thais Brentjens from Gionovum. And it's about uh, the table joining service and OGC standard for health statistics applications. Um, I don't <laughs> speak. Uh, I, I, my, uh, an, annule. Annule? Ah, yeah. I pressed the wrong key. <laughs> so, um, that's the outline of the agenda, or w what I will talk about. So, um, I, have a, I have a theoretical part, uh, then I have uh, some practical implementations. I will talk about the architecture, I have a, and I have a demonstration. And uh, the last uh, points are on upcoming work. What can you expect is happening there, and uh, what we would like you to contribute to this work. Um, so, Hannes said that we have, you know, uh, tabular data and we, but we, the, the, the objective of this workshop is how to combine tabular data and geodata. So, um, this worked always, it was always um, in, in the past, it was difficult, it was not that easy, and um, you always needed um, you always needed someone who does programming to combine tabular data and uh, um, geodata. So, and every time non-geodata, um, non-geodata or the geodata, th there was a change. You had to um, rework on the software and uh, program program again. So, it was time intensive and costly, um, but it you could do something. Um, what we are doing now with a t 
to, uh, uh, with a, a table joining service, um, the idea is that you bring together tabular data and uh, uh, geodata, put this into the service, the table joining service, and have an output format that can be, for example, a WMS or another service. And talking about Inspire, um, the output that comes out of the service can be immediately used for all kind of um, applications because it's provided as a service. So the TGS, the table joining service, is bringing together um, geo and non-geo data and is putting them out as a service. So far, so good. What do we need? We need unique identifiers. Um, otherwise, how would you reference the non-geo data with the geo data? So you have to identify those um, unique identifiers. That's the keys. And uh, a specification or a specific requirement for, the, for this table joining service is, and, and um, Bart briefed me yesterday and, had, and said, you have to say this again and again, uh, and you will see at the end why I have to say this again and again. There's a specific need. Um, the output, the TGS understands data only in GDAS format. Um, I was not explained what GDAS format is, but this is a spe specific requirement um, that is coming um, with, the, with, the, 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 uh, with the standard. So it's, it's kind of a uh, XMS, uh, XML thing. So you have the tabular data, you have to put it in a GDAS format. So you would, um, you would put the SDMX data, um, you, have to trans you have to transform this into um, GDAS and you have to do the same um, on, on uh, the geo, geo data and then the, the TGS can use both data, combine them, join them and put them out as a map. And here you can see the tabular data that can be all different kind of, um, of format, CSV, SDMX, um, SPSS and so on and um, the geodata that can be a GML shapefile um, whatsoever. Then you transform it into GDAS, important, and then you can use it, um, you can use the TGS and get a map. So, this is a generic this is a generic uh, overview how a client application would work. So they look into the data, they, the client application um, looks into the non-geo data, looks into the geo data, identifies the keys, does the transformation, um, and well, brings, brings in the end, brings everything together. So um, that's the generic overview. And this is the the um, the operations the speci that is specifying what the service does. These are the TGS operations, and that's valid for both the uh, tabular data and the non-tabular uh, and the geo data. So you have a service discovery, get capabilities, and then um, it's going through all. Um, you have the services, you have the data, you, you, you do these operations and then you have the data joining, that's the actually the joining the service and this brings together, um, well, that's the background, so to say, of the, of the standard. Good, that was the theory. Now we enter the practice. So, um, GeoNovum has very good connections into uh, Eurostat. Um, therefore, um, GeoNobum helped with uh, data or with uh, um, connecting to Eurostat. And um, we all heard about ELF, the Euro European Location Framework Project. We have presentations yesterday and today. And in ELF, we have um, various topics. And one topic in ELF is health. 
So that was a nice use case to bring together geodata and non-geodata and here in the, in the health domain. And um, so let's see what Eurostat brings to the, to the table here. <laughs> So Eurostat health, has health statistics, um, over 300 tables, and the interesting thing was that the, they probably have much, much more, but over 300 tables had a key which could be immediately um, used together with the Euro boundary map. And that is, um, was very exciting because you, can, you could immediately test if the DGS was working. So. You have the, again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but that's it. You have the non-statistical, uh, you have the statistical or table data. Um, this was uh, immediately with an identifier that could be used also, at, and with the same idea, immediately used with the Euro boundary map. They were joined together, and the output was a format that could be immediately used for all kinds of operations you wanted. So the idea of use and reuse data that coming from different organizations for potentially new applications. This is an example how this can work. That's a table, I'm not a st statistics person. Um, <laughs> so, um, these, this is how this is how the tables look like, and uh, I, what, what this was is, that? This is our data explorer from Eurostat, and if you want to get the data out, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, no, uh, please yeah, go ahead. Uh, here you see the causes of this. By nuts too. By nuts too, correct. And if you click on it, not by the, thunderstorm. Uh, table opens, <laughs> and you can download. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> perfect. That was the table that was used, and. Um, so here again, I'm, that's again the same picture. You have the input. SDMX uh, comes with a, in a REST API format, and you have the Euro boundary map as WMS, a web feature service. And the output um, that comes out, come out of the table joining service, can be a, a web map service, WMS and OGC, WFS, GeoJSON, and GML, GeoPackage, Geo package, uh, JSON and uh, uh, LD, RDF, um, all kind of different uh, formats. Again, this data, this format has to be trans transformed into GDAS before be, before it can be used or can be the, before this, the standard can use this data. Okay, so I show the uh, demo a little bit later. From an architectural perspective, and I'm 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 repeating myself again, but it's 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 very. Um, when I saw it, I said, mm, that's very simple, but I don't know <laughs> the whole background um, of it. Again, the CSV data, um, you have uh, as, as health statistics data, you need a GDAS transformation, um, and then you have the maps, and, and in the, this example is the municipalities in the Netherlands, the Gemeinden, um, and provinces. They are brought to, together and displayed in the map and can be used um, by different, um, well, customers, clients, um, by different agencies. This is the final architecture. Um, again, here, very, very separated. The table data, SDMX and the REST API need to transform the transformation service, SDMX to GDAS. And then um, the the joining the joining service starts and brings up um, you know different formats. You can use this as a WMS, WFS. I mentioned that before. And uh, so on, on the very top, these were applications that were used um, in in this example. I um, I have some more so some more information uh, a little bit later and on on these applications. So I have the. Uh, the demo right now. Thank you soon. So I use an example from the Netherlands. Kids. 
it worked before. Um, it's actually showing what they have done in the Netherlands. Um, So we have statistical data here. Um, I don't know all the background about the data, but um, that comes as a CSV file. Um, and then you have to identify a key, and they used a GM code, that's uh, um, the municipality's code, Gemeinde code, or Gemeinde code. So, and then um, that was sub submitted to, to, the, to the software. Um, then you, the, the output is a WMS, a web map service. You can copy that. Um, you can add another, uh, you can add another WMS and connect both of them. So um, another WMS comes from a server and um, then you have the, dub, the, the, the output coming from the, so to say the input coming from the table and the input coming from the map or the geodata um, and you can put it together and here in this example they used QGIS um, and uh, so the background is they have that's a statistic on caregivers and their stress level so you can uh, again then you know symbolize what you need um, um, put the the classes the, the the statistical classes together and then um, they decided uh, to have an orange to have the value and then you apply it and you see in the background the map comes up and that was very fast and then you can d do of course some you know you click on one of the of the um, statistical areas and get additional um, additional information. Thank you. So that's the next. That's that was the demonstration. What I was I was explaining. So um, to the euro boundary map, I have to say that um, that's kind of a disclaimer um, that has been used for this example, um, but it's still. Um, you know, it's not it's not officially uh, it's not officially labeled for the use in the ELF project, but uh, it can be used for this uh, for this demo and use cases here and for the example uh, on the testing um, environment in the ELF project. So, um, upcoming work. Um, what needs to be done is. Uh, you know, finalizing the data transformation uh, from Euro uh, Eurostat data. And uh, last week there was an OGC technical committee meeting in uh, Geneva, and there was a TGS ad hoc meeting. Um, and uh, so there was decided, or GeoNovum is working on the on the uh, server side of the implementations and of the work, and a partner in the ELF project with this uh, uh, Slovenia, uh, Thomas Sagar from the Geodetic Service. Uh, they made a client side implementation, Kaspar, and you saw this uh, was one of the. If if you go back, ah works. So here one of the clients that has been used was the Casper client uh, that is uh, coming from Slovenia. Oops, that was too fast. So um, now remember I said don't forget we have to transform this into GDAS. Now comes the nice thing. What? What if we could do the, if we could use different formats? Not only GDAS. Um, if we also could use CSV directly. So, and um, last week in, in Geneva, this was part of the discussions um, that, that the people who are participating in the working group decided we would like to have more support for other formats. And this is kind of, this is uh, for other input formats that can be much, much easier used. Um, so, and GeoNovum will take a lead on that and issue a change request to this existing standard. And now the <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do anything. So um, 
This means that the standards working group, the TGS uh, standards work, working group, will be um, stand up again, and they will work. Um, they will work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you saw people. We didn't do anything. We didn't touch it. <laughs> so, and that would be so. If this works, that would be also a very nice output um, for the Elf project. Um, so, but I, no, I'm fine. I can. I can. Uh, <laughs> you don't need. It. Anyway, the presentation will be available. But what? But what I, I, I summarize now. It was the second last slide. So. Um, just keep in mind, I, I, you saw on one of the slides, GeoPacket, when the, to, uh, the, the um, table joining service was developed, GeoPacket wasn't there at that time. So, of course, we have to look back into the, into the service and see what new formats can be, can be used. So, um, and um, then the idea, well, the, the ELF uh, project, they have two platforms, and Oscari is one of the platforms, and uh, there's people around here that carry very nice Oscari t-shirts, so that's the finish. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> Turning around. So, um, in, in ELF, in the ELF project, you have two platforms uh, that are used. One is uh, Oscari, and the other, uh, other one is Argus Online, and I think this TJS is also um, um, experimented or work with um, on Oscari. So I, I want you to understand the potential of this TGF, of this uh, table joining service. We all talk about or make use or reuse our data coming from national mapping agency for different applications for e-government uh, projects. So ELF. European Location Framework Project is about using um, NMCA data and other contexts, and this is a very good example. So, if we if we manage to have different formats um, used as input format and output format for this TGS, I think um, you know just think about the potential that is there. So it opens up it opens up also geodata, um, uh, geodata um, into e in all kinds of uh, e-government applications. I know it's not that easy as it sounds, but uh, you know if you don't have uh, visions, what well, so um, another output of the program uh, of the meeting last week was that Bart and now really Bart, not uh, well, Michelle or Thais, so Bart took an action to write an article on TGS uh, implementation to raise awareness about the standard. And what would be fantastic, uh, those of you who have implemented uh, the table joining uh, service, if you could get back to Bard and let him know about these implementations, because he can reference them uh, in the article, uh, use them as an example, and uh, yeah. So we still need a reference implementation for the uh, table joining service, and that would be uh, also a, an excellent opportunity for, if you have implemented the standard, um, well, to, to get more visibility and uh, um, for the whole community to raise the awareness how uh, table data and uh, non-geodata can be combined. And uh, the second last slide here was um, <laughs> TGS is available, available on GitHub. So, um, unfortunately, I didn't memorize the, URL, uh, the, the website, but um, you, will, you will find that. And then you can immediately contribute, participate, and look it up. Good. Thank you. That was my part. <laughs> Any questions to Athena on the table join service? Just a very quick comment. I, I appreciate this could be very helpful when it comes to producing a lot of reference data. So there's a lot of aggregated information and statistics, uh, statistical organizations, uh, but also um, various branches of government. But I spent four years working as a GIS analyst, uh, and that's my job that you're taking away. <laughs> so well. There's a positive side of being able to produce a lot of data. Are the advantages of some hands-on analysis. So I would do a lot of work with health, as it happens with health statistics, 
And by doing that work, I was able to improve the data sets. The first thing that happens when you map data is you spot a lot of errors in a data set that nobody else does. And my question, therefore, is do you have any notion of how errors are dealt with? Imagine it's like a geocoding operation you would normally find. The postcode isn't right, so you get some mm. feedback. Mm. How does it work with the TGS? Yeah, good question. Next question. <laughs> you know? So now you can, you know, um, Bart is here and he might join us. Oops, sorry. He might join us for the next session and, and he probably can give feedback on that because I wasn't brief on that. <laughs> sorry. Okay, maybe I can answer from my, from my perspective. I mean, you're working in GSC. There's even Image, the tool from the European Commission for the mapping. You know, taking away the jobs from the as from the analytical guy, but the point is, you are a specialist. You're not the the average person who makes a map and needs to have just a quick map, right? So you are a specialist. Yeah, I mean that's and that's you. You need to move out of that specialist specialist scene into the. You want to make that everybody makes a map. But this is also I agree with you, but this was also general training for all our undergraduate students. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what I wanted to ju just to answer, okay, if you make a map, if everybody makes a map, he immediately will spot that he has done an error, and that not 12 steps later on in data quality control, or you, even at the European level, you come back then to the lo local person and says, there is something wrong with your data, your, uh, your uh, hotel beds for your nuts region is somehow m messed up, so he can immediately see it at his time series or his spatial distribution is wrong, that he just puts a comma at the wrong location. So if you come back, then you can give feedback on that local level and he can fix it immediately. And even in that one, because you could give feedback to the data producer who provides the table, and you just even write an email or give feedback via different communication uh, channels. At least that's from my perspective. Um, for example, for this image tool, where we're doing similar thing like that one, table joint service, just on an ArcGIS level. It's just doing the same, but it's just only sorry for internal commission purposes, just to make quick maps. We have this use case there. And there, there's a tool actually up front which just checks that the NUTS codes are okay and correspond to the uh, desired year. So for example, NUTS codes from 2006 are different than from the 2010. So there's a time awareness NUTS code checking. So this is a kinds of, you get immediately feedback, huh, here I need to go back, here I have data from there, no, I cannot use it, I need to go take, take the data from there. So just as a feedback from that. Thank you. Further questions? So the point is, at least this, we are, we are, we're bringing it out, out of the pure statistical domain into a GI domain, which then, and you are, I completely agree, if I understood your correct question correctly, what are we doing next with this data? Now, if we have it processed with a table joint service, and we're putting it even in a web feature service or whatever, we can do further analysis, find out how many... Um, that people do we have about age of 60 uh, do we have above 2000 meters whatever you yeah yeah you can make all kinds of uh, further processing i mean this is opening up at least from my perspective what's the interesting thing about the t table joint service is we have functionality 
and SDMX is a standard for on the even UN and United Nations level, so we can distribute statistical data and whatever we develop here can go globally and can be used everywhere in the world to do to harvest these statistical data into our GI world data and vice versa. Um, we proceed. One more question. Just a personal answer. I take your top of it. Imagine what you can do with all this quality of time you're not working. <laughs> or you can work somewhere else. I think we need to think about value of work. <laughs> That's my personal. You know, I think you bring your own machine. Um, I have to apologize, that's the university machine. And uh, do not turn off. Thank you. May I introduce Ian Cody yeah. from the Official for National Statistics? Thanks. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, so this presentation really uh, has a lot of overlaps with um, what we've just been hearing about with the table joining service, but in some ways this is kind of a, a sort of a step back, certainly in terms of my role within the Office for National Statistics, because um, unlike the table joining service, I tend not to get very hands-on with statistics, and I'm probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not always overly comfortable with statistics. I'm a geographer by trade, so, um, but you know, you go along and you do the best you can. So um, just to kind of start off with, with kind of where we are and, and how we've got to where we are. Um, this is a quote that comes from page one of the UK location strategy, which ever is everything happens somewhere. So our kind of starting point was, well, if statistics are measures of things and everything happens somewhere, then every statistic has a location. And, and our job as geographers within uh, the Office for National Statistics is to try and make statisticians understand um, just how important geography is and, and sort of when statisticians start coming back to us asking, well, you know, how, how can we accommodate geography, um, then we know that we're doing our job. But uh, it's quite a complicated picture in the UK, so just to, to kind of set out why, why we went down the linked data avenue. So if we start off with the Office for National Statistics as an NSI in the centre, um, but we've also got National Records Scotland because the UK as a country is made up of four other countries just to make things more complicated. Um, and then we've also got the um, Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency, which is also a National Statistical Institute. So all three of these organisations are producing national statistics. Uh, we've then got Ordnance Survey, uh, who are the National Mapping Agency for the UK. So although we produce, uh, well, we produce statistics, we also produce statistical geographies, but then Ordnance Survey produce a lot of the administrative geographies and other geographic data. But only for England, Wales and Scotland, for Northern Ireland, we then have Land and Property Services who produce the data for the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. We then have a whole host of other um, government agencies which are also producing their statistics for specific domains. So we have um, DEFRA who produce environmental statistics, uh, business innovation and skills who produce things around employment, um, communities and local government, Department of Transport. So all of these different organisations and they sort of come under a, a banner called the Government Statistical Service. Uh, then we've got some commercial companies who both want to take our data but also feed data back in. 
and we've also got the local government associations. so as well as the uh, central government we have local government as well and what we end up with is data flying back between all these different organizations and because of the way that we're set up within within the UK the whole picture gets very complicated and, and it can become quite difficult to share data and to link data and, and to try and get it to function so I thought I'd just illustrate um, this is a, a, an actual example that somebody up at the uh, um, it Newcastle University, I think, um, came back to us with, which was, um, what is the difference between the age classifications 0 to 5, 0 hyphen 5, and 0 space hyphen space 5? Now, for us as people, we can look at those and say, well, actually, we understand that we're all talking about the same thing. All three of those are the age classification 0 to 5. But computers can't understand the differences unless you code it up and say well you might get this and you might get this and you might get this but actually we're all talking about the same thing so why we need linked data is to try and um, standardize the way uh, in which we talk about the relationships between things so when we're talking about uh, you know, a age statistics that actually we only have one thing that means 0 to 5 and we don't end up with different things all actually trying to say the same thing so what, what is linked data? Um, so here, here we've got an example of um, sort of, well, just a, a bit of information really, which is um, London is, is the capital city of the United Kingdom. Um, actually, you probably should say is capital city rather than has, but this is just a made up example. But um, the whole idea behind this is that we can create unique identifiers and, and we hear more and more about uh, unique resource identifiers so the idea is that we can come up with um, a http encoded identifier that means that when we're talking about london we know that we're talking about the london that's a city in england and we're not talking about one of the other londons around the world um, and likewise, you know, I'm sure there probably is only one United Kingdom, but when we're talking about the United Kingdom, we, that we know we're talking about the country. And, and so the more unique resource identifiers, the more URIs we can come up with, then obviously we know that we're talking the same thing. So going back to that previous example, if we had a URI that defines 0 to 5, and everybody's using that same URI to define 0 to 5, then it overcomes a lot of the issues that we have at the minute with trying to describe things in different ways. Uh, and likewise, we can also use the, um, what should be is capital city, but again, we can use uh, URIs to describe the relationship between things so that, if, we, if we're trying to look for information and we want to know any country that has a capital city or any city that is a capital city, again, if we have a URI that describes that relationship, we can put it in there and say, show me everything that has a capital city and it should return a list of countries. Well, presumably all countries have a, have a capital city somewhere. But, um, capital yeah, maybe a capital village if it's a particularly small country. Um, and so the, the way that we start to define this uh, in, in linked data terms is the thing that we're talking about is the subject, the relationship is the predicate, and then the attribute is the object. Um, and we put those together to what we call to form what we call triples. And so as I say, what it allows you to do is it linked data allows you to query the data in very flexible ways that you perhaps can't do with a sort of a traditional approach to, to data. So you can say, tell me everything that you know about London. And because it's using the URI for London, we know that we're all talking about the same London. So it can go off and return everything that it knows about London. We can say, tell me everything you know about the United Kingdom. So it can go in on that URI and say, what have you got about that? Or we can say, tell me every capital city and it will go away and return that based on that predicate. So this is, I think, the 2007 sort of uh, linked data cloud. And this really just kind of illustrates how linked data has grown over the past few years. Um, so it started off quite small in 2007, 2008, 
2009, 2010, 2011. So there's been a huge, huge growth in a very short space of time uh, with the amount of data that's being published as RDF being put out as linked data. And if we zoom, zoom it in slightly and just highlight a few. So um, up here we've got statistics.data.gov.uk which again is very small compared to some of the other bubbles and there are a few links in with places like Ordnance Survey there's Eurostat down the bottom so there are small amounts of data out there as linked data but what they tend to be is um, certainly in the case of statistics.data and I think probably Eurostat as well they tend to be linked data experts who have an interest in this and think well, I'll go off and do this myself and I'll take the data and I'll publish it because people will have an interest in that. They're not necessarily coming from the agencies themselves. And so then you start to get into issues around the sort of authoritative nature of the data. If somebody republishes your data, it allows for errors to creep in. So isn't it better if you just publish it yourself? And actually, that's what we found with the data that was published at statistics.data.gov.uk. Um, <laughs> They published it with the best intentions, but they actually used historic geographic codes, which we'd since replaced. And so what we started to then find was that people were starting to link in statistics to codes that we didn't want them to. And that was really one of the big drivers for us to say, OK, we've got to get in and start to get involved with this and start to look at publishing data ourselves. At around the same time, <laughs> Uh, we also had it within the UK a big push towards um, open data and um, what we call the five stars of linked open data. And the top one is, is for, for people to publish uh, your data as RDF using URIs and to get other people to link into it. So that's, you know, as an aspiration, that's where we really want to be. We want to be at that five star level. Um, where we were prior to this project, um, we were somewhere, some of our data was two, some of it was one, and some of it was not at all because we hadn't got, some of our data wasn't on the internet at all, we just couldn't publish it. So we wanted to move from that up to the five stars. So the, the, the project that we outlined and that we submitted to Eurostat was for a two-year project uh, to build a linked data system. Um, and the idea behind that was that we could use that to create a geographic framework, uh, which statistics could then be linked into. That we could take the data that we currently have spread across a number of different products, break those products open, and sort of, you know, consolidate all that data back into one single online resource. We wanted to use the URI so that data can be published directly to the internet and discovered directly on the internet. And then we wanted to link our data into, into data from other organisations and also get other organisations to link back to ours. So this was the sort of, well, th this is the architecture that we'd set out, but this goes sort of a little bit beyond linked data. But th where we kind of, where we were to start with was uh, we have people working on machines using standard uh, GIS tools that I'm sure everybody's familiar with and publishing data into a server. And that server stayed on the ONS side. It was entirely internal. Um, and if people wanted boundary files, we'd put them in on a DVD and we'd put them in the post, uh, which as a 21st or century organization wasn't ideal, really. Um, <coughs> we've got a another system which is about publishing the products, which is this side of things, so um, publishing out there. But what I'll say is, little bit of a plug I am actually presenting that side of things tomorrow so if you want to know more about that come along to that one um, but what I want to focus on really is on this side so that we wanted to publish data take the existing products run them through some translation software via FTP into a triple store and this sort of externally hosted um, bit for our linked data over the top of that, we then put APIs so that people can hook in directly to the data, and we also have a data explorer so that if you're not a developer, you can still get in and access the data directly. <coughs> so that, those three bits really form the, the, the bulk of the linked data system. So what, what have we done so far? So, so far, uh, we appointed uh, a linked data supplier 
which I think was was one of the first, if not the first, uh, open data procurement, uh, open procurement, sorry, of a linked data solution. Um, there had been a, a few that had tried sort of prior to this and, and hadn't got through because of the maturity of the market and things. Um, we then created some some translation scripts for converting our existing products as CSVs into linked data. Uh, we developed them in Python uh, partly because it was open source and you know again we have aspirations of moving from proprietary formats to open source but we also had existing skills in Python so we wanted to set out um, to, to sort of utilize the existing skills within the organization and build up our own skills rather than just going out to the third party and saying right we want you to do everything we took the uh, some of our products so the code history product the boundary files the lookups converted those to linked data and then we loaded them into a triple store uh, via our, a secure ftp um, we then put an existing linked data API over the top, which we'd actually done some previous work with, and, and part of the reason uh, that we did that was because we had, again, we had the skills in-house to do that. Um, and so we just kind of put our own configuration over the top so that it had our own internal branding on it. Um, and then the only part that we really farmed out was uh, we wanted to develop a front-end explorer tool which we handed over to the contractor and just said, look, we, we haven't got the skills to do this, so we'd like you to do it for us. <coughs> so what, kind of as an illustration, really, of, of where we went. So this is what we started off with. This is the sort of thing. So down the left-hand side, these are um, nine character codes that we use to identify each different geography. Um, if there were names here, they'd be in this field. We've got information about how the geography came into existence, what uh, statutory instrument we call them, what, which statutory instrument created them. And then we've got information about when they were created, when they were terminated, which, which geography they sit within, so relationships. Um, and then again, the sort of the high level geography. So we, we've got a lot of information in there. Um, but that's only one product, so if you want the boundaries, you go to a different one. If you want to look up the hierarchies and know how that geography relates to other geographies, you go to a different product. So we took that, <coughs> and I won't, uh, I won't sort of test you on any of this, but this, this is the Python script that we created. So the idea was that we took, well, it's really, this is the important bit up here. We took each of the fields uh, within those products, and we sort of worked out, gave it a name, and then in this bit here, this then tells it tells you what we actually wanted to do with that. So we wanted to start to identify the relationships. Last slide that features a lot of information, and again, don't, don't worry about this. Um, but th th this really is just an illustration of this is a lot of data. And that was really what this was all about. It was about going from, here are a load of different products, break them open, get all the data, bring it all back together. And so what we now he have here is pretty much the same information. But you can now see, here are the nine character codes, but they're now part of a URI. And so if you look for EO5005130, this is now all of the information that we have about that. So this goes back to the subject, this is the predicate, and then the object is at the end. So we can say that E500 has a label of, and unsurprisingly the label is the same code, but there's other information in there about, <laughs> <laughs> about the operative date, although that's off the screen. But so, like I say, the, the, the point is that it's a lot of information and it's great, you know, if you know how to use um, linked data and you're a developer and you want to take this and work with it, great. It's all up there and we've, we've published it all. But as I say, the, the, the other thing really that we wanted to do was say, well, okay, not everybody who comes to the data is a, um, a linked data expert. So can we put something over the top that will allow other people to access it? So we developed a front end. Um, and you can go, I mean, it's got the URI up at the top there, statistics.data.gov.uk, and you can go and have a look at that. Um, and I'm sure it'll, if you go and look at it at the minute, it'll boost our, our um, hits from Denmark. Um, 
I'll show you the world map in a minute. Um, but the idea here is that so th this is th this is the explorer tool, and you can see we've we've preloaded some of our local government administrative boundaries over the top um, as a kind of starting point, or you can go in, start typing the name of a geography in, and get to the information. Now, the reason that this differs from sort of some of our other explorers, and, and we developed an Inspire tool, but the Inspire tool only lets you search for a product. So it says, let me search for ward boundaries or parish boundaries or, you know, whichever product it is. This is now getting into the actual data that's contained within those products. So if we pick a, a geography, and I think I picked this one here, Wiltshire, which is reasonably large if you then clicked on that it zooms it in <coughs> so you can now see Wiltshire on the map but underneath we've got all this information that sits underneath it now what we've actually got is we've got boundary information we've got hierarchy information and we've got code history information so things that previously were sat in three different products all brought together now under one uh, URI that says we're talking about E0600054 up at the top there. Um, and because we've done that, we can then get all of that information together. You can see down here, there's this link down here is blue. Now, the reason that this is blue is uh, the National Archives within the UK publish the statutory instrument information as linked data themselves. And because they publish their data as linked, uh, their information as linked data, and we published our information as linked data, and we've linked the two together, you can click on that, and it'll actually take you through to the statutory instrument that created that particular geography. So when we talk about the five stars and linking your data to other people's data, this is where the five star bit is now. We've actually got linked data, and we've linked it to other people. Going back, um, if you look up here we've got a bit where it says select contained resources and what you can do is you can click on that and you can select from a drop down the boundaries that you want to see now again this is only possible because we have the hierarchy information and the boundary information contained within the same system now <coughs> rather than separate products so if I click on lower layer super output areas you can now see all of the lower layer super output areas for Wiltshire and then again you can click on one of those and it'll zoom in and again if we went down it would have all of that information underneath it. You can also um, do sort of bounding box searches so again this is under the locate tab and you can draw a, a boundary and then it will tell you all of the uh, geographies that fall within that boundary. Now, the reason that this is good for us in the UK is because we actually operate um, a, a statistical policy of best fitting, which takes small area uh, geographies called output areas and allocates them to all the other geographies based on a centroid that's the average, where the average population lives for that uh, small geography. Um, this is based on this, and as far as I'm aware, this is the only tool, other than again going to the CSV lookups, this is the only online tool that will actually allow you to uh, look up geographies based on that best fitting from output area. And then if you are of a particularly of a developing nature, um, we've also got the sparkle endpoint here. So um, you can just sort of see down at the bottom here the, the query that's been used to generate some of the data that we've already seen. So if you knew how to write the, the Sparkle queries, you can go in and, and you can sort of, well, you can find whatever data it is that you need and you can cut it in any particular way. So you can say, well, actually, I don't need all the code history information. I just want the boundaries and I want the statutory instruments or whatever it happens to be so you can cut the data. So it's, it's a very flexible way of getting at it. Um, so we launched the system back in October, um, and this is kind of how the system's been used so far. Um, we had 
sort of a little little spike around the user testing. Uh, then we had a big spike around the, the system launch, then it kind of died away again. And then we started tweeting it out over, around Christmas. We set up a social media account, and again, we got large spikes off the back of that. And then, as you can see, in week 24, we had this. Um, which was absolutely huge, bigger than the system launch, bigger than the social media stuff. And for a long time, we couldn't work out um, why, why we had this big spike around week 24. And it actually turned out that around the start of, of the new year, early in the new year, we had a lot of this in the UK. Um, we had some pretty serious flooding. And there was actually a, 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 an event that was run called Flood Hack. Uh, where they brought together developers and tried to look at ways in which they could solve issues around flooding and bringing together flood data and geography data. And what we realised later on was that that speak, spike at week 24 actually coincided with flood hack. So this was people taking our data in w and using it in ways that we'd never set out to use it. We just we put the data out there, people came in and consumed it. I promised you a map. <laughs> And there it is. Um, this is our sort of map that we, we, you know, we loosely keep an eye on of where the data has been consumed. So, kind of the, to start with, it was really just around here. And then when we um, first started tweeting about it, we had some interest in Japan um, and a little bit in Pakistan and India. But over time, we've actually seen there's been massive global interest in this. Um, and obviously the focus is still in the UK, which is why it's so dark, so much darker than the rest of it. But, you know, we've had North America um, have had a lot of interaction with it um, and places that perhaps we wouldn't have expected. Ethiopia uh, started using the data, had a look at the data recently. Uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, just again you know places that we we again wouldn't have thought that people would be interested in linked data from the united kingdom but there you go um and we also found we, one of the things that we try and do is look at uh the split of people who are using the data so again we would have suspected when we set out doing this probably that central government would have been one of the largest users because central government tend to be a bit more switched on to to link data or certainly are in the in the UK, um, but actually what we're finding is a lot of it's coming from local government and a lot of it's coming from academia. And perhaps we could understand the academia side of things because linked data still sort of sits a bit in the academic world. Um, it hasn't quite gone mainstream yet, but you know we, we wouldn't have anticipated so much interaction from local government. And so the final thing really that, that I wanted to show you um, this is from another government, central government department, the Department of Communities and Local Government, and this is their Open Data Communities Mapper. And this is uh, deprivation data for the United Kingdom. Um, and we create something called the Indices of Multiple Deprivation uh, that allows you to take small area geographies and work out compared to the rest of um, the country how your area compares to others. And what the Department of Communities and Local Government did was they took that and they published it as linked data. But actually, what we've really got here is we've got the ability to search by postcode, which is based on geographic data from Ordnance Survey. We've got the statistical, small area statistical geographies that have come from ONS. And then we've got the deprivation data itself, which is being published by Department for Communities and Local Government. So when we talk about linked data, this is three different government organizations all publishing as linked data linking together and then building an application over the top that allows you to utilize that now if you wanted to do that without linked data i'm sure you could but it would be a lot slower and so i sort of started off by saying that i wasn't particularly statistical and and i still you know i stick with that but i think what we're trying to do is by publishing a geographic framework we're hopefully allowing statisticians to start coming in and, and building their own applications using our linked data as a, as a starting point. Yeah. And that's it from me. Thank you very much, Ian. Any questions to Ian? Yeah. <laughs>
please go ahead. Uh, how do you think? Okay, let me read this. What is the future? Link data or a table joint service? I think that's a good question, and I'm going to say linked data. Um, uh, you know, I, I think they're interesting because one, one of the things that we saw with the table joining service earlier was that you can output as RDF, as, as JSON. So I think there's the potential for them to sit side by side. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to have a look at. Um, the outputs, the, the, the linked data outputs from the table joining service. And I'd like to see if we could get the table joining service working alongside our linked data. Um, I think once we've done that, then perhaps we'll have a better idea of, of which way it sits. But I mean, you know, I, I certainly talked to, to um, Peter Brasters of the Netherlands, who's um, done a lot of this work when he comes along to the Cisco meetings and things. And we've, you know, we, 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 we're both really keen and really interested in what the other's doing. So. I think for the time being, I'm going to hedge my bets and say they can both exist at the same time. I may come back in 12 months and say, no, it's linked data all the way. Ignore the table joining service stuff. Well, that is, uh, yesterday at the public uh, PSI, is it public PSI, services, yeah. uh, basically the, uh, Google was uh, arguing for a very simple, practically equivalent of a CSV, slightly above it, you know, higher up. And uh, basically saying that is if you make it simple enough and easy enough for people to use, it will make it much more widely used. And you can see linked data is, I still can't understand it. Been like for two years trying to yeah. get my head, I even manage a project on it, I still don't fully really understand it. <laughs> so, so you have that, you know, from the very simple Google data structure to the linked data. And where do you think, you know, the, the yeah. So, I mean, uh, it, it is still very complicated um, and it's, I've been working on it for the best part of four years now and I still don't think I've entirely got my head around it. Um, but I think, it, I think that there, there are benefits to having it in the linked data format that we're doing it through using things like the URI. So although the Google approach might be to simplify things, you've still got to have some core elements like the URIs to, to make sure that you're all talking about the same thing in the same way. What we've tried to do with this is, is recognize that linked data is very complicated and not everybody wants to take things in a linked data format, which is why we've gone down the uh, Explorer route to try and provide people with a nice simple front end that they can get to the data. One of the things that we're working on over the next few months is to look at adding um, CSV export functions, things that will again simplify it further um, so that hopefully people will feel comfortable working with it and they don't have to necessarily recognize that they're working with linked data unless of course they're linked data experts in which case they can go down the sparkle route and, and do all the nifty queries that they want to do. Okay. Uh, two more questions, Athena and then up there. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know. Quest, not a uh, question but an answer to your or a idea to your TGS or the data. Actually, that is the reason why Bart is not here because he and Phil Archer, um, they, they have a joint OTCW3C workshop um, down there to look together on how to work with the linked geodata. And there was a workshop in March in London. And I, I, I wrote it, I noted that down, and I know that the people from GeoNovum there a lot, they look also that are active in the data. So it might be also a question what do you want, what do you need? Maybe the one thing matches better your requirements, um, the GS or the data, it depends on what your requirements are. Um, probably not either or, but something in between. But we'll work on that. <laughs> No, it was quite the opposite. The, the, the problems that we had with the products were, they, were that they were too large, and that's why we weren't able to publish things like our boundary data um, through our own website, because the file sizes were too large. By converting it to linked data, 
as long as you've got a, a sort of a, a bandwidth that's large enough for you to get the files uploaded into the triple store no we've never had any issues uh, with the file size I think I think perhaps with one of them we had to split a file into two you know into into two to get it up there but um, no there's there's never been any issues with that how much of the actual geo geotech that you convert into a triple store, or do you just use the, the geotech to um, to access to make it possible to access the link data via a map? So, how much of the geotech is really converted into a triple store? Uh, it's it's all converted. We we yeah yeah. So we 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 convert it to GML. And then we publish the GML as an attribute of that URI. Um, the idea behind that being that you can then have different generalizations, you can have uh, different file formats, all associated with one URI. But yeah, we, we do. We publish everything as, as linked data, including the coordinates. Okay. More questions? If this is not the case, then I would say we all grab a coffee and we see each other at 4 o'clock. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your questions.